Welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Today's guest, Luke Wyatt, who is a former employee within Vanderbilt Athletics. And uh, Luke was a very interesting guest. Portions of the podcast have been edited for brevity and a couple of other things. But in any case, Luke had a very revealing interview, and I wanted to be able to share his firsthand account of what he has seen. The episode is presented by Wellspire Nashville's Learning and Development Center. Wellspire offers personal and professional development opportunities in a beautiful facility in the Gulch neighborhood. Stop by for an event with world-renowned speakers or host an off-site event that will wow your team and your clients. Thank you also to our co-sponsor, the Well Coffee House, which turns coffee into water and has a mission to bring clean water to the world. Today's news presented by Sutherland and Belk, an SEC sports-loving injury firm in Nashville. Sutherland and Belk will shoot you straight on your rights and options when you've been injured in an accident. Call them at 615-846-6200 to get your questions answered. You may also visit them online at sbinjurylaw.com. Vanderbilt baseball knocks off Evansville Tuesday afternoon at Hawkins Field. That score six nothing. Jack Leiter gets the start and the win, and the Commodores have won six in a row. Our guest line presented by our friends at Bowl and Branch, started by Vanderbilt graduate Scott and Missy Tannen. I had no clue what I was missing in Bowl and Branch sheets until I got them. The sheets are fair trade certified, meaning they are made under safe conditions by men and women treated and paid fairly. Try them for a month. You can return them for free, but you won't want to. Once you have the sheets, try the mattress. That was voted the best mattress of 2018. Go to bowlandbranch.com. That's spelled B-O-L-L. Enter the promo code Vandy and get $50 off your first set of sheets. Joining me now is Luke Wyatt. He is a longtime employee of Vanderbilt University, recently retired. Luke, welcome to the program. How are you today? Good, Chris. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Well, the reason we're doing this is I have done a lot of what I have done so far with anonymous sources. There are reasons for that, as people can guess. And you have been willing to go on the record with your name, as people can guess. You have been a source of mine throughout this story. And Mm -hmm. I want to just let the audience know, in your words, who you are, where you're coming from, what you did when you retired, anything that might be pertinent as background before we start our conversation. Absolutely. And I'll I'll be as brief as I can, but it does take a minute because I was at Vanderbilt for around 40 years. My full-time employment employment at Vanderbilt lasted 33. I was there in a part-time pay-by-pay voucher for a while and that type of thing. But I started at Vanderbilt in the 70s. I even, heck, I've done everything over there. I used to be in charge of the program sales, souvenir sales, and then I ran balls on the sideline before becoming the assistant equipment manager for Bill Kelly full time. I became the head football equipment manager. I did that my final four and a half years at Vanderbilt, and I was a supervisor of all equipment and uh, ran the Nike contract and that type of thing for sports. Uh, So I've kind of run the gamut. I've been in the building. I've been through – uh, 11 foot, I've worked for 11 football coach, coaches in some form or, or capacity. I uh, worked for several athletic directors, several operations folks. And I retired really a couple of years before I wanted to. Reason being, I, uh, I was trying my best with my supervisor at the time, who was Kevin Colon, just trying to be the squeaky wheel. I was trying to get some things done for my department, as well as some other things that I thought I could be helpful with, like possibly voting on who goes in the Hall of Fame or being on the committee. Um, Just things that with my uh, length of service at Vanderbilt, I thought I could be helpful because before I say anything else, I want to make sure everybody understands. I love Vanderbilt athletics. I love those kids. They were my life. I've never had children. They were my children. I spent 16, 18 hours a day there for those first 25 to 30 years. Um, Then when I, uh, got the promotion i was pulled away from the students and fortunately or unfortunately yeah it was more money but i found out the inner workings of the department and our shortcomings and that's the reason why i left because i was seeing how bad it had gotten and i wanted to do something to help and I, i knew at my retirement party which my wife had thrown for me which we had at least 75 former football players 25 other athletes couple administrators which was amazing that that would happen 
all the way dating back to the 70s, back to Dennis Harrison, all the way up to Zach Stacy and people like that and Chris Marv that were there. So I just want to let everybody know that's the first and foremost reason I'm doing this is because for those student athletes, I love them and I want what's best for them, and they're not getting what's best for them. They may think they are, but they're not. And also our fan base. I was a fan first before I became an employee, and I'm a fan now. And I feel like that someone's got to stand up and tell the truth. And what I'm giving you is not sour grapes because I have nothing to gain from this. I'm just saying, here's what's got to happen. You don't like it. You don't believe it. That's fine. But from the departmental standpoint, I don't know everything that's gone on in the Board of Trust and that type of thing. But from the athletic department standpoint, I can give you some things that will absolutely make your jaw drop. Why is it so hard to get things done there in just a normal fashion? I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but I think we've had enough conversations privately to where I know a lot of the stories. I know that there are stories we haven't even talked about, but there's always a common theme, and it's just that it's hard to get stuff done there for athletics. I mean, we could speculate on a lot of things, but you know a lot of why. What can you tell us that you would vouch for as fact from experience? Well, for instance, I'll give you just – this is at the lowest levels possibly. Um, Vanderbilt doesn't even have a shipping and receiving. One of the things I was trying to get done when I took over as the supervisor of equipment services, which was for all sports, touching all sports in some form or fashion, they wanted me to create an inventory system. Well, I said, well, we need to purchase one with software and do barcodes like you would at any store. Well, of course, that cost a little money, not a lot of money. I think it was $15,000 or in that area. Well, they didn't want to do that. So they had me create, <laughs> which I'm not the greatest or something like that. So I had my sister-in-law, who worked at Dollar General at the time, help me create a, a, a program just from scratch. And it was okay, but it's not what you need. You know, it's not going to be an accurate inventory. It's just going to give you kind of a small you know, telling what you do have in inventory, but it, it was better than nothing. But again, they wouldn't, they wouldn't do anything. They wouldn't work with me because Vanderbilt doesn't even have a loading dock. When all that equipment and inventory comes in for the buildings and everyone's personal mail, it goes to a mail room down behind the uh, dining hall. And it most of it sits in the hallway until it's distributed to where it goes. It's just sitting out there for anyone. You, you could have a, uh, uh, something come in for strength and conditioning, an entire pallet of, say, cherry juice that they drink. It just sat in the hallway for two weeks. I took pictures of it and showed it to my, my supervisors. Look, we got to solve this problem. we got to have a place where we take your inventory. It's just on a high school level system that I was trying to employ. Because if you hear this, you're like, okay, they don't have a shipping receiving department, whatever. You can make adjustments. You can still get things done. You don't have a loading dock, whatever. Those things probably seem insignificant, but I think what you're getting at is it leads to, it's a hard situation to manage, A, and B, it also has led to theft. No question. And and, and what, it, what it also speaks to is you're not even willing to do the small things that you should do that a high school would do or a... Uh, you know, the other 13 teams that you compete against every Saturday in, in athletics uh, and football and athletics, everyone, I understand Vanderbilt's the only private school and the other 13 are public schools, but I have friends at Northwestern, at Wake Forest, at Duke that I've talked to, and they all just laugh about it. They're like, you what? You don't have a, you don't have, and we don't have an equipment room for Olympic sports. There are only four sports they have an equipment area where they can be serviced, and that's the basketballs, both basketballs, baseball, and football. The other sports, the equipment staff or whoever it may be, if, if it's after their hours and they're not allowed overtime, they're all, they're, none of them are salaried that I know of anymore. If you have a sport that you're in charge of and, it's, and they're playing at 7 o'clock at night and you blow out a pair of shoes, your coach or your administrative assistant got to go run in and track it down and get a pair of shoes. It's crazy. I mean, Innsworth is run better. MBA is run better. Why is it so hard to get something basic like that done? That just doesn't make any sense to me. Vanderbilt is a university with a 
crazy endowment. I know you don't just spend endowment on sports or whatever. That money is regulated and those things. That's not what I'm saying. The point is Vanderbilt right. has the capacity financially to get things done. It's demonstrated through its endowment. It gets a huge check through the SEC. If it's really interested in its student athletes, and that's what you hear about constantly, why are these basic issues still issues for decades? I mean, it just it doesn't make any sense to me how these basic things, as you say, are issues. Explain that. Well, th- that's what I mean. You you can't explain it. You can't make it up. It's unbelievable. Um, I, you know, I've had former players come in our building, and they'll come by to see me, and this is football and basketball and baseball, and they'll come by to see me or something, and I would take them up to football. And I would say, you know, these guys may want to give money, but they'd love to see what we've done facility-wise. Or maybe if you run into one of the coaches, say hi to them. They don't They don't want that. They used to tell me, don't bring them around unless they're giving us money or unless they were successful and played for James Franklin football. I was told that by the operations manager who is still there. When you create that kind of atmosphere, you're not going to spend any money for the little things that we're, we're trying to do. All you're trying to do is get some athlete to give you money to add something to the weight room or do something specifically to make your office look better or to this deep water room that they have upstairs that's, in my opinion, a huge waste of money. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But we can't get the little things done because of that, because no one listens to anyone. If there's five people that run the department, they're everyone else, the other 195 over there have no say-so. I'm not talking about coaches. I'm talking about other employees. That's why nothing gets done. And there's no accountability for the leadership in that department. They just run them up and they have their fiefdom and they do what they want to do and what they think's right. But there's no input by anyone else. I heard Candace yesterday on George Plaster's show make a comment about transparency. Wait, why are we just now talking about transparency? I heard transparency mentioned by Todd Turner years ago. None of that's changed. Okay, yeah. you were basically, I guess, a department manager is a good way to say it, right? Middle middle management. Right. Huge. So middle management has a chain above them where you have some input and some say. And I'm, I know you well enough to know this isn't just idle bitching. Excuse my language. That These were right. things that you tried to resolve ahead of time. And so part of that is the input that you give to the people above you. I'm presuming here, I think I know you well enough to think that you, you went through that, but talk about that process and what happened when you went through it. My supervisor for the last, I don't know, at least 10 years was Kevin Colin. Kevin's no longer with the department. He had some health issues, I believe, and then he left. He left probably six months after I did, I guess it was. Well, I would go to Kevin and Kevin say, Luke, I get it. I agree with you, but I got to run it through, run it up the flagpole, run it through Candace. And I'm like, wait a minute. I thought David Williams was in charge. And he'd say, Luke, David's through fighting there. these battles. It's going to be Candace. I say, okay, that's fine. Cool. I said, I'd be glad to meet with Candace. You know how many times I met with Candace? Zero. It doesn't no. make sense to me no. if you're trying to run a university. And I'm not disputing what you're saying. I just, it doesn't make sense to me. You have accountability and you have structure and you have people that are supposed to look after things. I don't understand the way this works. It's because you're not, you're not empowered to do your job. When Gordon Gee came with David Williams, that's one of the things he was trying to get done before Gordon left. He wanted the athletic department. And I think we were moving toward that in the first five years of let's get back to, let's go all the way down to who buys the paper clips and everything. And let's get that part right first. But we haven't. We haven't gotten that part correct first. And it's hard to make all the big things go right when you don't have a clue about how to just get the basic things that these athletes need. I'll give you a perfect example. One year, the lacrosse team, they were out of money. I had money left in my budget to get them, buy them hand warmers. And I told Kevin, I'd like to buy them hand warmers. Okay, well, let's run it by. I said, wait a minute. I've got the money. I'm giving it to them out of my budget. No, we can't do that. If we do that, you won't get that money back in your budget next year. Well, tell me that. Does that make sense? Am I an idiot? Or You know, I'm trying to help lacrosse with something, and we're doing fine. We didn't need anything else for that 
budget year. But I was shot down for that. I, you know, that's the way they operate. Were you ever giving, given an explanation? Well, here's my explanation. Kevin would always say, well, I got to run it by so-and-so. And then I would never get an answer. And after a while, you get tired of beating your head against the wall. You say, okay, well, I've done what I can do. What else can I do except ask? So I wound up giving them 30 hand warmers from football just to go on to play a game up in Northeast where it was a foot of snow. Ridiculous stuff. And that's, that's just one example. Is it a case I mean, of being understaffed? I mean, it, it just – I'm trying to well, understand why I, things work the way they do. To, to me, understaffed is crazy because when I first started working at Vanderbilt, we had 70 – I think 78 people when I was full-time. There's over 200 now, and we have the same amount of sports. Now, I understand things are different. There's always growth in every area. However, there's – in my opinion, there's too many people. It's just like in football. They're crawling on top of each other up there. There's not enough office space. You see how big Jerry Stackhouse's staff is in basketball. I don't agree with that. Oh, do we have as many people with state school or Alabama or Tennessee or Florida? No, we're never going to have that. And I get that. I have no qualms with that. But we have enough people in the building to get it done if the people in charge, and I'm speaking of the administrators in the building, the associate athletic directors and the assistant athletic directors, and the operation manager, they don't want you to tell them anything. If you came up with a cure for cancer, they would say, no, no, I've got to figure out how I can make that my cure for cancer, not yours, Luke. That's what we're up against. And that's why that I've said from the beginning, when I called in Georgie's show a month ago, until you clean out that department, that's why I left, until you clean out that department and get fresh people in there, that don't have any of this in their system. You know, Candace has been around a long time. It's not her fault, but it's ingrained, it's ingrained in her, the Vanderbilt way that you've heard. That Vanderbilt way is not a good thing. Well, the Vanderbilt way, and I've criticized this, and I've taken some blowback, and I understand why. I think that a lot of the things that are contained in that are good things. Obviously, honesty, integrity, those things. Nobody yeah. would disagree with that, but it just seems to take on a new life as it relates to athletics. And it seems to me that it gets used as a crutch to say, well, we can't do this over here because of academics and we can't spend the money over there. That's the way That's that it. I have interpreted. Is that fair? That is 100% accurate. And I will give you another one that a, an, a former – He's been an athletic director of Division One College, and he was a, he was my supervisor at one time. He was at Vanderbilt. Told me as he was exiting, he said, "Luke, I love you. I appreciate everything you do. Don't become vanditized." And I said, "What do you mean?" And he said, "Don't become vanditized. Don't let this place change your ideals and the things that you think are important for student athletes. You do it the best you can within your budget." And do it the best you can. Don't become vanditized. Now that's a very successful person who left that department because of some of the same reasons I left it. He was tired of beating his head against the wall. I want to ask you some things about budgets because you were one of two people that sort of turned me on to an angle of a story that I'd not thought of. And I'll walk back. This has been, I think, three weeks ago today. When Malcolm mm -hmm. Turner or the announcement came out that he was let go, I think it actually may have happened a few days before that. I had never thought about this. And then you were one of the people that got me to thinking because what was out there was that Malcolm had spent a ton of money and all those things. And the thing that I keep saying, okay, this is not a defense of Malcolm Turner. What I have tried right. to do in the stories that I've written is say, hey, here's one side of the story and here's the other side of the story. And I do think that the side of the story – that was used against him, I think has got a lot of fair elements in it. It's got a lot of truth in it. But you said something to me that caused a light bulb to click on. And what you said to me was that you cannot just go spend money willy-nilly all the time without it being known. That right. And I had another source later that not only backed up what you said, but gave me some more details that I didn't know that you had not given me. So... Back to where I was going with you, 
it's really impossible to spend money recklessly there without approval. I want you to explain oh. that to people because you submitted budgets for years. You know how yes. that process works. Just give us the lowdown yes. on that, please. Okay. I'll work with small numbers to make it easier. Let's, my budget list was $250,000, let us say, for football. Up until the Derek Mason staff got there, what I would do, that's when they took all the budget stuff to football and upstairs where no one knew really what you had. You just bought and they said, yeah, you can buy this. Here's how much you can buy that. So you got clearance from upstairs. So that's what changed in, it late in my career. But let me take you to where it, where it works basically today. Okay, if I've got 150000 in my budget and, I want, and I'm going to spend it on helmets, shoes, and shoulder pads, but there's a new helmet that comes out and it costs twice as much. So my budget needs to go to 275000 I have to submit that that's going to happen six months beforehand. Now, most of the time, you're not going to know six months beforehand. Then, you, then anything that's above, I think it's seven or $10,000 becomes a capital purchase. You have to submit that a year in advance. They give you a form. and you. So if you have to buy, say, a new gator for the practice field, or, you know, I'm just using my examples because of things that I've worked with or a golf cart or whatever it may be, all that has to be submitted. So to get money, they know if I, I've been called in and said, Hey, you spent $112 more on this road trip than you should have. What happened? And I'm like, Oh gosh. Okay. The truck broke down on, on the way to Florida. We spent this and this. And I have to go back and look at my receipts, but whatever it may be, if they're knowing $112 is missing or not where it should be, you don't think they know where seven million is? And I know this for a fact because I was friends with the former business officers, three of them, and they all told me the same thing. Luke, what they're feeding us is not true. When I get in the morning and turn my computer on, I can pull up exactly what was spent. And Candace knew. She had to know how much money, if she, if, if she was in that office. She had to know how much money was being spent. She was involved in most of the processes. Mr. Zeppos told him one thing, but we can't operate that way. That's what, in my opinion, happened, and I feel 99% sure that's what happened. But to answer your question again about the budgets, absolutely. Candace was aware. Campus Brett Sweet had to be aware. Philip Brown in the business office had to be aware. It wasn't a secret. There's a lot of things I'm thinking. I want to circle back to That's the fine. budgeting process. Okay. You told me that a lot of times you had to spend money at your budget at the end of the year to make sure that you had it for the next year. Explain that. And that Okay. Uh, if, it's almost like it gets back to the thing with the lacrosse where I had, let's say, a small amount. Let's say I had $2,500 left to buy apparel. Okay, if I had $2,500 $2, left in apparel, if I didn't spend it in football, whether we needed it or not, if I, just, if I decided, I, then I've got to figure out, okay, I'm just going to buy $2,500 worth of T-shirts for the summer because if I don't, I don't get the money back. Whereas I could look in lacrosse's budget, and they didn't have a dime, but yet they needed T-shirts. I could not transfer it to their budget and give them the money to where they could buy $2,500 worth of T-shirts. Now, tell me that makes sense. And maybe that's the way budgets run worldwide. I don't know, but it makes no sense to me. I will defend them a little bit. Sometimes you have to have policies in place that at some point those fall apart. Too. But it does seem like there is an element of common sense that's missing. And I just find that to be a big element across the board. I mean, there's a lot of smart people at Vanderbilt. They do a lot of great things, but I think sure. these are the things that befuddle a lot of people that you and I are talking about. Absolutely. I, you know, and, and uh, again, another budget thing that, and I think I told you this, one of our former budget officers told me, I was in a meeting one time, she said, Baseball was, this is when Roy Mubin was our baseball coach. And baseball was getting ready to play Florida, and they had to sweep them to make it to the SEC tournament, I believe. And she mentions in the meeting in front of me and several other people, gosh, I hope baseball doesn't win this weekend, because if they do, we've got to come up with the money to pay to go to the SEC tournament. Are you kidding me? 
the obvious question here is, there's a chain of command. You followed that. It goes up the line. Does it get stopped at the AD because they just don't want to push? Does it get stopped at the university level? That may be hard for you to answer, and I don't want you to speculate any more than possible. And if you do speculate, right. please let me know. But I just keep wondering where things run into brick walls over there. Well, it, it depends on who your supervisor is, and, and that's that's really the problem. I, the, the, the biggest thing, Chris, that, that people need to understand and that needs to change, and the reason why I'm exposing this, is because I have sat through what could have been so much better for three or four different sports when you're not when they won't allow you to help them, and then they tell you, well, we're going to do this for football, and that never happens. It's because it. I think it stops there because maybe they already know what their answer is going to be before they ask it, so they just don't bother asking. Well, does that come from the university? Does that come from... That's why I'm at a loss to ask you questions because, like, how does this happen? Well, again, there's no way to know exactly because all I can do is ask my supervisor, you know, and and they always protected David. That you know, we're not going to let David get involved in the day. This is too small time for David. David's on the. Wait a minute, it, it, this isn't small time. You know, it'd be something that was huge, a huge deal. And it would always be Candace. And, and again, my feeling was the last year and a half, and I was told this by David Williams when I had an exit meeting with David because he asked to meet with me when I told him I was retiring and I turned in my resignation letter. He wanted to know why. So I met with him briefly. And he told me, well, Luke, I'm sorry things didn't work out here toward the end, but I've been checked out for the last year and a half anyway. Candace is basically running this place. And I'm sorry that it happened the way it happened. You know, he'd just grown tired and weary of it. Okay, that's another topic. David mm-hmm. turned the AD over to Candace. You know for a fact, you know what, how, and when did it happen? I don't know exactly when, but like I said, what he told me, this is David's words. He told me in my exit interview, this was on September the 28th of 2018. He said, Luke, when I, when I explained to him, David, I'm leaving because I, I'm frustrated with the, the, the direction the department's going. I've been frustrated with for a while, and I, I don't need to be carrying this home anymore. I need to get out of this, and I want I want to help when I leave here. And he said, well, I'm sorry that things haven't gone well for you toward the end of your career here, but I want to let you know I'm che- I've am i been checked out for a while now. Uh, I've just been over here because I was asked to stay over here, but Candace has been running this place for the past year and a half. So let's go back a year and a half from September 28th is what he told me, basically. So if David was checked out mm-hmm. and he's admitting that to his employees, why is he still on? Why is Vanderbilt asking him to stay on at that point? Well, he's, in my opinion, he's still on because of I mean, it's millions of dollars that he's getting paid. And the next reason would be he's grooming Candace, he hoped, to be the next athletic director. Because he'd said that publicly to me before. We were all standing on a practice field in football one day, and I was I was actually joking with David because David and I had a pretty good relationship at times. My wife and I picked him up at the airport when we played at Florida. And he was very very outside of the, the the realm of work work day work a day stuff. He was great, but we were standing at the practice field one day just chit chatting and talking about football. And uh, I said, David, how much longer are you going to hang in there? Just jovial talk. He said, oh, I don't know. He said, but we're in good shape. I've got somebody coming in right behind me that's ready to take this thing over if they'll let her. So I have to assume that was Candace. Yeah, well, that was the common thought at the time. Uh, That didn't happen. I guess you were gone by then, so you wouldn't know why that did or didn't happen. But, or if you did, you're welcome to, to say, but the restructuring, okay, that happened back in 04, I believe, where Gordon Gee disbanded the athletic department. A lot of people think that that still had some adverse effects. There's still a lot of that I don't know. Walk back to that time, what happened, sure. what came of it that's good, what came of it maybe that is lingering into the present that's not so good. Okay, I'm when it, when it first began, we had a full staff meeting. Everyone required had to be there. 
We have a full staff meeting in the football team meeting room. Gordon Gee and Davey Williams, the two in front of us. Basically, Gordon talks first. He was the good cop. Davey was kind of the bad cop. He basically told us we got to drink the Kool-Aid. That's the words he used. He said, we're changing a lot, and it's going to come fast. And if you're not with us, you're not going to be here. It was kind of a tough talk, and I had no problem with that. I get it. I knew what they were doing. But then I found out from actually Mr. Gee, who was very open. I will say that for going to get, he was very open. He came in with his bow tie cookies one day into the equipment room. And I had two minutes of his time. He says, he goes, I've got a couple of minutes, anything you need. You know how Gordon talked. And I said, well, I just got a question. The the changeover was, what was the main, what's the crux of doing this way? Why, why are we structuring it this way? He said, he said, one of the main things you need to know is we can now pull for more budget areas and, and it'll help athletics. In other words, by putting it under the umbrella of student life, you now open up several other budgets and you can move money around. So I think that was the first reason he did that. That's my opinion. And, and it did help. There were some things that need to be done back then that had been ignored. And he did take care of some things. Uh, it was great until Gordon left. That's the, and, and I don't know, after a while, I think that will work great for a while. I think it hurt recruiting or the league you know, and all those questions that came up, but it actually was a good thing. And I told everybody I knew that it was a good thing. No, you're missing the point. This is not why they're doing this. They're doing this for monetary reasons more than anything. And I had heard the same thing at the time, and what followed was an era of prosperity like Vanderbilt had not had in a while. Baseball became a factor. Basketball got better. Football, within a few years, would start to do some things we'd not seen in a while. But a lot of people still feel like that decision has repercussions right now Uh, that that are harmful. And that's what I, I can imagine some of them, but I don't know some of them. That's where I would like you to fill us in. Okay, for me to do that, here's what I like to do. You take it back before it happened. Take it back to when Todd Turner was athletic director and when I worked under Rory Kramer. Um, we had a smaller department. I think that one of the things that happened is you started adding these sport managers, and they started giving out jobs like Tic Tacs and promotions like Tic Tacs to basically, I won't say unqualified, but people who weren't ready for the cert- for a certain job. I never pursued one because I knew, in other words, a man has to know his limitations. I, a man has to know when to stay in his lane. But a lot of people, that all they see is, oh, I can make more money if I do this, even though it's not best for the department. So they were promoting themselves, kissing butt or whatever you want to call it, to get a position. And those were those sport managers' positions. But what's happened is, those people that move in those sports manager positions, when someone leaves, well, they just get another sport. In other words, let's say when Drew Fan left, well, someone else took over track and golf that he had, and they just add it, and then now you're a sport manager. You should have a couple of associates or three. You know, again, I'm just giving you my opinion here, but I think that's where it's hurt and where it's now starting to be some negative dividend is that. What used to work has now kind of gotten out of control with these sport manager positions because they're not really earned. They're just given to people. And I I don't necessarily sense malfeasance in some of this, but it just seems like there's a culture there where things have been run the same way for a while, where they don't bring people in who understand how athletic departments are run from the top, and it just kind of perpetuates from there. I liken Vanderbilt to, Luke, you probably know this, okay? Mm -hmm. Do you remember what the bleachers in left field and the outfield for Mississippi State baseball used to be like before they redid that stadium? Yes, yes, yes. And that people would bring in these hollowed-out vans or make their own bleachers, and it just kind of became this organic thing where stuff got built, no. and it wasn't planned out ahead of time, but you just add one piece here and you add one piece there, and right. next thing you know, you got a rusty van over here and things like that. And it just reminds me of kind of, you know, 
Mississippi State eventually, and, and there had, was some cool charm to that, but they took that away, and they're like, okay, mm-hmm. this is the state, and we're going to build it from the ground up. A lot of Vanderbilt just seems to be piecemeal, where they've done things a certain way, so they just add another layer to it, and that's kind of how it gets to where it is. I don't know that it was intentional in the beginning, but it gets to be where it is in that kind of a process. Is that fair? That's very fair, and that gets to what Brad uh, for, for what I was told by that athletic director when he left, assistant associate athletic director, about becoming banditized. Don't just put a band aid on things. Vanderbilt has forever put a coat of paint and new carpet on things. They haven't fixed it. They haven't repaired it. They haven't renewed it. So, and it's done. And they've done the same thing with their employees because those people know how to continue to make it work. Or not work, but make it survive on the lowest of levels. And and this is getting into a little bit of a different subject, but the other thing that's happened, a lot of the people at Vanderbilt, when I first started working there, just about everybody was passionate about it, and they were Vanderbilt fans or Vanderbilt supporters. I cannot count on both hands how many Vanderbilt employees come, because I still go to Vanderbilt basketball and Vanderbilt baseball games. They have season tickets that we buy. I don't see any staff, except the ones that are working the games, no one comes and supports the team anymore. That's what's happened. Not only with the facilities has become eroded, and people just sit there and say, well, okay, we know we're not going to get the money for this, so we're not going to fight it, or we're not going to. The same thing happens with the employees. They just get their check, leave at 430, you know, the, the old saying is, if you want to find a Vanderbilt employee, if you want to interview a Vanderbilt employee, go stand in front of the door at five o'clock and take a charge. They'll be coming right out the door because they're getting out of there. They're not staying to support the basketball team. They're not going over to Hawkins Field to support the baseball team. It's a it's a job to them. So your own people aren't supporting those kids the way they should. I can tell you a ton of times when there had to be an email sent out that if you don't use your tickets, give them to another Vanderbilt employee, don't give them or sell them to opposing fans. Do you think that happens at Alabama? They'd be fired the next Monday. That's where Vanderbilt's at. How do you change that? You change that. First of all, you change that by rooting out the leadership in the department. They have to go. If they don't go, and I said it's that it was a day I'm sitting at McDonald's eating a sausage biscuit. I said, I'm tired of it. I'm going to let everybody know. I'm tired of all the speculation. I'm going to tell them what it's about. And I, I called, I actually called Mark Howard that morning, spoke briefly with him and Kevin Ingram, but they didn't give me any airtime, maybe like a minute, and then they went to the next commercial or whatever. So I thought, I'm going to call George. And I, and George said, Luke, I'd love, you can have as much time as you want to take off. And he gave me 20 minutes or so. And I, and I, I said that, that forget, forget facilities, forget coaches, forget the board of trust, forget the university. You got to fix the athletic department first. And, you, and if you don't get those five folks out of there, I'm sure there's others, but those five that are in charge and making the decisions inside the athletic department, until you get rid of those folks. And I'm not saying fire them. It, it's been known forever at Vanderbilt that you get reassigned somewhere else at the university. So don't, don't take food out of their mouth. I'm not, I'm not for anybody getting fired, but send them to the university. Listen, Brock Williams was called into Gordon DeGee's office, and I can say this that it's Brock Williams. He was called in Gordon Gee's office and said, you now work. He was the dean of housing. And he said, you now work in athletics. You're going to work for David Williams. That's how that happened. So the same thing should happen. They should go in and take those five people and say, you now do this same job that you're doing, but you're doing it at arts and sciences. Or you're at the divinity school or whatever you may be. You're over in administration, whatever. That's how you do it. And then you put five people in charge. First of all, the number one, obviously the athletic director has to be the guy, but a passionate people that are passionate about Vanderbilt. Not going to be there two or three years to pop that resume up and move on. You know, we have that in football coaches. If we ever have a successful football coach, we all know he ain't staying long. 
that's not that there's nothing you can really do about that in my opinion unless the guy happened to be if Watson Brown would have been successful you know he might still be there but I'm just saying most cases in if they're successful they're moving on and we're we're in a situation where those five people are comfortable they aren't held accountable for anything they do David let Candace run it Candace now has her little fightsome still in place it was easy to run Malcolm and them off because Malcolm was doing some spinning that he shouldn't have been, but it was easy to push him on out the door and let's put Candace in charge. With Candace, someone said to me, I think she does what she thinks is right. Uh, I just think that I think what is right to her is how things have always been run at Vanderbilt. Is that a fair statement? That's a fair statement. I don't think she's evil. I just think she's banditized. And And that has been the criticism that's been out there for a while. And when I went to the press conference, I asked her, because I wanted to give her a chance to answer it. And she really did. And I said, because the reputation that she has is that she's a lot like David and that she's just going to be kind of in that mold. Again, I'm not there, so I don't know. And I think the fair thing to do is you give somebody an opportunity to answer that question. And it's right out here in front of public view. I asked her that at the press conference, and she basically didn't answer it very much. Now, I get that maybe her head is spinning and a lot of things are going on that day, and she's jubilant that she's got the job that she's always wanted. But it was frustrating when I asked the question to try to figure out, okay, what is it that differentiates you from David Williams? What would you do differently? What would you do the same? And when you don't get an answer, you don't really have any clarity. So you're no closer from your vantage point. When she ran the department, what was different about her than had been different from David? Nothing. It's the same thing. There's nothing going to change. Nothing. The only hope we have is that the university says, okay, we've got what we want as an athletic director. Let's help her. So financially, they throw a ton of money at it. I don't see that happening. I think it's going to be more of what we got. But I think that's the only way that this would work is if they they were just – Hell bent on her being the athletic director and throwing money at it to make it work to make them look good. Because they're getting public criticism, obviously, not just from me, but a ton of people. Listen, I talked to former athletes. We are talking, and I can go ahead and say this on the air. I think we're going to form a committee. Sometime we're supposed to meet sometime in May. I'm not going to mention people's names right now, but it's prominent former athletes, former employees. Uh, from a variety of sports that are concerned about what's going on and try to set up a meeting with the chance, the new chancellor in July. Cause I think that's where we're at at this point. I don't think nothing gets done. You know, this rollout with this strategic plan, I'm interested to see what they say there. If it's a guarantee or just a fundraising campaign, which no one's going to give to her or give to them. Hardly. I shouldn't say no one, you know what I mean? I mean, when you can't even finish get all your money for a locker room project or whatever it is you're trying to do, I mean, uh, it's ridiculous. Let's talk about the audit. I think we went over that earlier in the program. But Vanderbilt had an, an audit of its Olympic sports that it basically ignored. What happened there? Well, I think what, uh, what happened was, and, and I was involved in this, we had a theft. So it, it triggered an audit from campus when the, when the theft was caught. And uh, they said, well, okay, look, too many people have keys, too many people have access. And then not only that, you don't even have enough area to secure equipment. So my thing was, of course, I've been telling you this for 10 years, that we need an Olympic sports room to, to house everything. And we need a loading dock or shipping and receiving to account for everything. I mean, I've been – telling them that for years. So anyway, they're like, well, okay, how are you going to get this to fit? How are you going to fix this? 
So Kevin Cullen tells me, well, Luke, buy some cabinets. I'm like, what? What, what, we, what do you mean? Uh, it, we'll, buy, we'll just get everything in cabinets. We can't have stuff just sitting in locker rooms anymore. I said, well, Kevin, most of the storage for some of like track and some of the other sports, their storage is in their locker room. Now it's, it's under a combination lock, but you know, as well as I do, the coaches will tell a player in a heartbeat. Yeah. Here's the combo. I'm busy. I'm with a recruit Go in there and get your new pair of socks or whatever. So it's not secure. It's not the way it should be. They're not supposed to be. It's, it's really a violation. So that's where we're at. And that's where it's still at. There's still stuff in locker rooms and, and, and that players would have access to. And they're in flimsy U-line cabinets, like, like you said in the article, that you can pop open with a screwdriver. They they haven't built anything. I even said, how about sheds? Even though it doesn't look great, at least let's get some sheds for these guys to store their equipment in. Nope, not going to do that either. Wouldn't even spend money for a $5,000 shed. With the caveat that this is speculative, okay, but you have also been there 40 years and you have an idea of why things are the way they are. What is your opinion on why Vanderbilt has just not gone out and gotten an AD from another place? Because it has had no shortage of candidates from what I have been told. Uh, that is true. I think the reason why is because they want to, they, they will not do what an athletic director wants done when they interview. I think what stops it, you know, you, you can have the best interview in the world and then you, you give them this and they, and they back away from you. If you say to them, I'm going to answer only to the chancellor. I'm not going to answer to a bunch of committees. or I'm not going to answer to the board of trust. I'm only working with one person here. That's what most athletic directors, and I've been told this because I know seven or eight of them that are athletic directors at Division One level. They say that's why they don't want to touch Vanderbilt is because you know your answer before you get there that it, they're going to work behind your back to save the money. They're going to tell you, just like they tell coaches, that they're going to get a new whatever it may be to come there. They do the same thing with athletic directors, just like what happened with Malcolm. I have no doubt Malcolm did some things wrong. But the reason why that didn't work was he was told one thing and it was totally opposite when he got in there. Well, my so understanding I, was that Malcolm legitimately had charge to do those things. And I think that the place I got that from was someone who would know. I The, the thing that I have been told is that it changed when Zeppos left. Is that true? Was that false? That's correct. No, that's correct. That's what I'm saying. When Zepp- if Zeppos would have stayed, and, and been there, I think it would we would that Malcolm would still be here, and so would Tommy Smith. I really believe that. Where's this all going to head? Well, if they don't again, I, and I said it, I go back to the very first statement I had on Georgia Show. If they don't change the workings of the inner workings of the athletic department itself, it has to start there. That's where the core of it is. You don't get that with brand new folks, brand new ideals and ideas and not banditized people was if that's not taken care of, then you can forget it. It's not going to get better. It'll, if anything that happens will be pure luck and great coaching or whatever it may be. It's like how we landed on Tim Corbin. We were lucky enough to get Tim Corbin out of, uh, if, if 15 people apply for that job, he was probably the only one that could have done what he's done. And thank goodness for John Sisk, who was the strength coach at the time that worked, knew him well and was his strength coach at either Clemson or Western Carolina. I can't remember where Presbyterian, maybe if he didn't, if he didn't have such a good relationship with him, Tim would have not never been there. Okay. Explain that one. Well, every, well, Todd Turner took credit for that. You know, I've hired, you know, everybody said, well, Todd Turner hired, well, yeah, he, t- he hired him, but he had nothing to do with it. He didn't know who Tim Corbin was. It was John Sisk. He went to Todd Turner, him, Bobby Johnson. I think Bobby knew him as well. And and they were the ones that said, hey, give this guy a call. And the rest was history. I'm going to go into the mailbag because some listeners had some questions. And our mailbag is sponsored by Vanderbilt Fan and Independent Insurance Agent Josh Minton of Brentwood. If you need home, auto, motorcycle, renters, landlord, life, or commercial insurance, 
Josh is a guy to contact. Call him 615-933-1979. Email him at josh at hqinsurance.com. Follow him on Facebook at JD Minton HQ. He's my insurance agent. Give him a try, and I think you'll be pleased. Uh, Bobby Two Times says, what is a major misconception about the Vanderbilt Athletic Department, and what's a major truth? The misconception is they, that they do everything they can for the student-athletes. And I, they don't. Academically, yes, absolutely. And, and I love that. But the when they walk in that Imagugan Center, You'll probably, and, and I'm sure they brainwashed a bunch of those kids who think that, that, that they take care of them in, in every way. But there's really only four sports that get the gold treatment. And there's 16 sports there. 15, if you look at it, that track is one sport, indoor, outdoor. But there's 15, 16 sports, and you're only having four that are getting the gold treatment in the building. Now, the the one that's true, I guess that's the same answer because academically they are getting everything at their disposal, as they should. Yeah, and I think uh, that is where Candace deserves a lot of credit. I think that she and David did work for a lot of things there with the students and, of course, they had opportunities to travel abroad and things like that. Seems to me yes. that that is where a lot of the praise from her comes from. Um, yes. which is, is great, and I think that's needed, but it's also not the primary function of an athletic director, and I think that's where the criticism right. comes from. Well, well, there's a lady that needs a ton of credit, too, that you may or may or not have heard of. Elizabeth Wright runs academics and, or, or runs the, the study center, I guess. I don't know the proper name, but Elizabeth Wright is fantastic. She's been there a while. She is not banditized. She's wonderful with those kids. She loves every one of them and is looking out for their well-being at Vanderbilt and beyond. But let me say this, too. When you – for instance, what we're going through in basketball now, 35 losses out of 36, whatever it is, when you start saying you're going to give your athletes the best chance and the best experience and all this, is losing part of an experience that's good for them? Are you giving them every advantage when you're not winning games because you're not either – changing coaches or you're not doing whatever it is, is facility-wise or whatever in the classroom, and you should. But the college experience, I had so many players tell me, Luke, the reason why, you know, I may talk to them on the phone or see them on a Facebook page, they said, Luke, the reason we don't come back is because we didn't win. So tell me that's a, something that they don't carry with them the rest of their lives. And not everybody's going to be the champion. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just being competitive. And that's what's sliding big time over there now. I made a point with an article this weekend after the Georgia game that I don't think got really understood, and I'm not really in the mood with people to argue about it. But I understand that the Georgia game, the way they lost, that was kind of a fluke. But my point was they had a guy had a career game and some things like that, and they're still they're out there playing walk-ons. And it was not a shot at what Jerry Stackhouse has done, but the point was no. it's so hard to get transfers in and things like that that the roster – now, I know that Bryce Drew did a lot to damage the roster, and I'm not faulting that, but I think there are conditions with transfers and things like that that have been existing for so long that my point was not that things haven't gone horribly wrong, that my point was that at Vanderbilt there's a lower floor than there is any other place. Like Kentucky could have things happen. And I know that's not a fair one, but a lot of schools, these kind of things could happen, but the floor would not be as low as it is now where they've lost 33 of 34, I think it is, in SEC play. And that was the point I was trying to make. No, you're exactly right. And and we don't – you know, people say, well, Duke, Wake Forest, and Northwest, and those are three good comparisons. You think – Mike Krzyzewski has to wait to find out whether he can get a kid in. I mean, if we were, let's just say we're going head to head with a basketball player at Duke. I mean, let's just say Wake Forest. Well, Wake says, yeah, you're in. We got to wait three more days to let you know if you're in or three more weeks. I don't get it. That's way, way over my head. I don't get it. Why it has to be that way. Or I don't think it does have to be that way in my opinion, but. Why is Vanderbilt different? Same thing with grad school. Listen, Matt Ryan. I went and saw Matt play. 
a couple weeks ago. He wasn't going to get into grad school. The comment he gave me, Yanni Wetzel, I don't know if he was going to get in grad school or not, but he's probably going to be a, possibly a Final Four team. Those two kids would have been back. Yeah, well, one in particular, well, they could use them both right now for sure, and particularly Yanni oh, Wetzel, absolutely. who's playing out of his mind at San Diego State. Right, absolutely. And, and you know, I'm not sh- – Mac can shoot three a little bit anyway, so we may still have our streak intact if Matt was here. Bobby two times wants to know what has been the biggest failure of the athletic department. The biggest failure is I I don't even say brainwashing. I don't know if it's intentional, but is is now from a fan's point of view or athlete point of view. Let me. I guess I need to ask that because the, the failures are different, totally different in both in those areas. I'd like to hear it's your answers fan, on both, actually. Okay, from a, from an athlete's point of view, it's the a uh, facade that you're getting the greatest experience you can as a D1 athlete at Bamboo University. You're not. Not as a football player or uh, or as a bowler. You're not. They tell you that. You're getting the academics, absolutely. You're getting every average, and again, that's great. But all the other ancillary stuff, you're not getting what, you know, what people are getting at Alabama, Duke, Wake Forest, Northwestern, or Tennessee. You're not. From the fan standpoint, from sidewalk alumni or even former students that are fans that live in the area, because they tell you we're doing everything we can for these student athletes. So again, it kind of intertwines, but again, you're being told one thing and they're doing another. How much does winning and losing get discussed over there? Not much. And let me just say why and it goes back to that word i've used th- throughout this bandy ties a lot of a lot of people are just happy to be there a lot of coaches not right now because there's a lot of great coaches in the department right now but that has happened to where they say okay look we're vanderbilt if we go 500 in the league happy if we beat seven straight, six straight losing seasons so that should answer your question there. How much damage did James Franklin do? Well, and this is getting in the weeds a lot, but you know, you have to throw in the what rape case that happened on his watch, but you can't blame him for that. I'm just saying, unfortunately, through all of that, and then he get it. He was getting. I will say this: he got more than any coach because he demanded it. He and Tim Corbin, that's why they like each other, I, in my opinion, because first of all, they both were psych majors, I think, but they they get what it takes to win. They push the envelope. They demand certain things. Uh, we, I, I am 100% convinced we would not have an indoor facility without James Franklin. The budget that James was given was at least 25 to 30% more than what Bobby Johnson was given. I don't include the Robbie Caldwell year because that was just a stopgap. When Brian Reese was there, and I don't know if you know Brian, but he was the ops guy for Bobby. I mean, you would see Brian rolling around drinks on a two-wheeler because he didn't have enough help. Once Franklin got there, you could, there were so many people running around doing things and getting paid that it was ridiculous. No, the operations guy never touched anything. He just pointed which direction for things to go. So, so then that, when James leaves, we kind of go back to the way it was with Coach Johnson in some ways. Now, the football budget, and this I assume is because of the money from the SEC, the football budget itself is still very competitive. Again, it's not what Alabama's is, but it's never going to be. But I think if you look at it compared to, say, an Ole Miss, or Wake Forest, it's on par. Just the operating budget. Did James get things because James won and then got things, or did James get things because they decided they were going to give James a chance that other coaches did not get? That's exactly what your last statement. Um, I can remember having a conversation with someone who we both know that 
given a ton of money to the place. And he told me, he said, Luke, things look bleak. Now, this was the day of the Wake Forest game when they were dismissing Caldwell and there was probably 5,000 people in the stands. He said, today's a dark day, but we're getting ready to change things around here. We're getting ready to give football a chance. That was the, that was the words he told me. We're going to give football a chance. So I took that to be, we're going to throw money at it. We're going to get a good coach. We're going to support that coach with whatever he needs and wants. Uh, and that's what happened pretty much. And he won, you know, he won as well. And he won right away. It's it's very similar to what Corbin did. Corbin run right, if you remember, he, he won right away that first year. We swept Tennessee and got in the SEC tournament. And things just took off from there. I had the same conversation with the same person about the same thing the same day that you did. And so I can, <laughs> can attest to the conversation I'm sure you had. Where did this go off the rails again? Was it the Vandenberg rape case? Because it just seems to me like they had it going at that time and they finally were getting some stuff done to a level they never had. And then it just went away. Well, I, I will tell you this, and this would be someone who went with James Franklin who left and he's now still with him at Penn state. He told me when he came to say goodbye to me, he said, Luke, enjoy working with you. I, I'm sorry what you're about to go through. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, things are going to return to the way they were before we got here. And I said, you mean budget? What are you talking about? He said, admissions. I said, oh, okay. I just left it at that. So you can take that for what it's worth. I don't know what that means. Did that mean GPA or someone's background, how they vetted athletes? I, I don't know what that meant. Well, that's what he told I believe that meant that some of the exceptions that he got were being taken away because I think some yeah, of the exceptions exactly. that he got may have been involved in the, the case that blew it all off the rails. Yes. You got it. Pedor says, what are some of the facility upgrade promises you heard throughout your time at Vanderbilt that did not come to fruition? Okay. I'll start with my area and then I'll move on on from that. I saw three blueprints talked to three engineers about the equipment room slash locker room project. That was going to be improve the equipment room, improve the locker room, do it all to where when recruits came, a lot of schools, the equipment room is the area where they go see all their new stuff, their Nike gear and whatever it may be. They wanted to do that. So recruiting weekends, that's what it was like a, you know, place for everybody to go and the parents could come in and see everything and see where their kids are going to be every day. Because that's the first thing to do is get dressed every day, obviously. So that was the first thing. Three times that I saw blueprints for that and nothing ever done. I was in that equipment room from night when it was built in 1989. I moved into it in 90. During that time, I got my office was the only place that had carpet. I got new carpet once. It got a coat of paint once. From 1989 to 2017, when I left, they refurbished the equipment room. Okay, I'll move on. First training room project was killed because the hospital couldn't get together with the donors or whatever. I, you know, I don't know this. Tom Bossing may be able to tell you, but I, I think Tom was ever the first one that was supposed to be initiated but then they did wind up getting it later on so at least one of those was shot down stadium projects stadium improvements locker room improvements i saw two of those shot down never happened wait um, let me stop you there shot down where were they shot down who shot them down basically we didn't raise enough money the money wasn't there that's what i was told money wasn't there we didn't raise enough money would one of these been around gonna... the middle of the last decade Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, the, the first one was 1997. In that time, maybe 98. And then the, the other one was 2000, around 2012, 15, something like that. I don't know. I don't know from, from anything else facilities wise. There's not, again, we've never even explored options for some of those simple things we need, like an Olympic equipment room. They always use the excuse of, well, we don't have space. We're landlocked. 
Oh, well, they're buying a ton of property right around the stadium, and yeah. my understanding is none will be used for athletics. Oh, where the Wendy's is, that's not going to be used for athletics, huh? That's wow. what I believe is the truth. Well, you can look at their plan. They have it online, and it says okay. – I mean, it, Vanderbilt is already putting that out there, so I don't think that's speculative at all. But Wow. The last stadium thing, my understanding was around the middle of the last decade that that was going to be included in the capital campaign. I'm positive that was for a fact. It never happened. So the excuse that you also heard was that they didn't have the money raised. Well, that all goes back on David is the way that it was explained to me. Uh, is that where the culpability was put internally? Uh Yes, because I remember a comment he made at a staff meeting. We Every August, we used to have a staff meeting. And David made a comment about, I've got broad shoulders. I'll take the blame for it. The reason this ain't, isn't happening. I remember that comment. Was that genuine or disingenuine? I think it was not tongue-in-cheek, but, you know, a bunch of, you know what, that's okay if you're not going to do what you said. You, you know, so I think... I don't blame – let me just say this. I don't blame that one on David. Was he stopped? Really was he hindered from raising money? Well, I know there's a, a thing with raising money that you can't talk to certain people. I know that. So it, I would say yes. I don't know that 100%. But I know for a fact that you, there's certain people you can't talk to in athletic. If you're if you're a Mark Carter or – heck, I'll give you a perfect example just from my small – Corey Davis and Jamie Duncan years ago came to me. They, they made, came by the equipment room one day and presented me with a watch. Beautiful, I don't know how much it's worth, watch. I've still got to this day. And they said, Luke, we want to do something for the equipment room. Who do we need to talk to about that? We talked to the head coach. I said, no, you have to go to the business office. Um, and I, I think Michelle Kennedy was there then. We want to build you – an equipment room and name it after you or whatever. I said, well, I don't care about the naming, but it would be great for the kids if they had a nice new equipment room. They wouldn't let, they wouldn't take the money. They said, we'll take the money, but we'll spend it how we want. So they said, well, we're not giving you anything. We, you know, we don't want it to go to whatever general fund or wherever you decide to put it. This is where we want it. And they said, no, we can't do that. Was that coming from the university? Was that coming from athletics? That's coming from athletics. I hope, and I've heard that that's changed since. I hope so. Uh, maybe Candace could speak to that. I don't know, but th I can tell you that happened. Buperior says, uh, tell us a story about Bell Buckle. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> I'm glad someone's lightning that. A bell Buckle, a hell buckle is what we called it. Yeah. Um, does he want to know why we went or just a story about what happened up there? Let's <laughs> let's hit it all. Okay, well, the reason we went, when we had our first staff meeting with Jerry DiNardo, he said, okay, he goes, I'm big on isolation of these kids when what we're going to do to them in August. And that's the way we said, the way he said it in the staff meeting. So he said, we got to find us a place. Any of you guys here that live around Nashville, you know a good place or whatever. I think someone came up with the idea, maybe Rick George at the time, found Bell Buckle and decided we're going to go there for camp. So we get it worked out with the first day. Great story. The first day, the buses get to the exit and they pull over. Everyone's like, what, what are we doing? We're stopping here. And uh, <laughs> Coach Tadardo gets everybody off the bus and they have to run all the way to the web school from the exit, which I don't know how many miles it was. It wasn't just a mile. Just, let me say that. So that was the first thing we did to get to camp. Miserable conditions, the gym. Where they had to take showers in ankle-deep water. I mean, it was just basically to toughen them up. Uh, and, and, and I'll be honest with you, it served its purpose the first couple of years. Now, when we went with Rod Dowhower one year, it was like Club Med. We did nothing. If it was too hot, we didn't practice. It was really funny. But, um, yeah, that's just a couple of good stories from Bell Buckley. It was it was not much fun, I'll say that. I wonder why Dowhower didn't work out. Excuse me? <laughs> that was why? That was sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh Hugh Pierge says 
What would you suggest can be done about a major facilities upgrade with the football program? Besides the stadium itself being obviously improved, to me, here, here's my opinion. If, if for the stadium, and this is for the fans and the players and the and recruiting, if you make it a 33 to 35,000 seat stadium with chair backs instead of the 41,000 or 40,000, whatever it may be, have the end zone be a great big pirate ship looking thing, kind of like Tampa Bay has, where you can have par- private parties or whatever. That way you don't have to build a bunch of expensive suites. I think that would be a lot less expensive from what Shelton Quarles told me it cost at Tampa Bay. So I, that would be my thing with the stadium. And we obviously need to improve where they're at at halftime. The holding tank they go in is just a – it's I mean, it's not a locker room. It's tight. Everybody's in there elbow to elbow. It's like being in a visitor's locker room. The kids need a better place to be at at halftime and before the game. Too cramped. Well, if you build the pirate ship, that makes Mike Leach more attainable if he ever gets sick of being in store. Yeah. Mode. <laughs> so is that game. <laughs> uh, Raiders nineteen sixty seven says, "What are the most important problems in the Vanderbilt athletic department? How should those be addressed?" I think you've been over that, but if there's anything in there that you didn't get to, you can answer that now. Well, I, I guess you know because of where I come from, the grassroots of the department, the the basics have to be improved, and I would say that uh, across the board for everything. Even the four sports that are get everything they improve them, uh, but just the every day when they come when the kids come in, what they have to go, you know, like players lounge for football. To me, that's needed nowadays. I, you know, they have a little small area upstairs, and unless that's changed in the last year, which I don't think it has, it maybe five kids could be in. That needs to change for football, and. Uh, some stadium upgrades with baseball, I think. I, I don't know if Tim would agree with that, but there's some things they could do to make Hawkins Field look better aesthetically. Raiders 1967 says, from your viewpoint, how biased is officiating by SEC officials with regards to Vanderbilt? Oh, I think it's uh, – oh, I am so glad this question was asked because I have some firsthand experience with this over my years. Uh, let's start with football. And and anyone can go back and look at this. Of course, being eat up with Vanderbilt like I am, it hurts so much to lose to Tennessee as many years as we did consecutively. If you go down and look when replay started, and Chris, you may know this, when did replay get instituted in the SEC? Oh, I don't know, but it seems like that's when things start becoming a little bit more fair to them. I agree. And, and Vanderbilt-Tennessee games, yeah, there was a share of blowouts when they blew us out, but during that stretch, I went back and did research, and there was 11 times during that time that with replay, we either win the game or it's going to overtime or we're kicking a kick to win it. That's how much difference replay has made. And I'll give you two other instances of where there's bias against Vanderbilt and other teams, not just Vanderbilt. Other teams, let's say a Kentucky that's having a down year or an Ole Miss that's having a down year, where – officiating comes into it we're playing uh i forget who it was uh, at, at vanderbilt there's an official who's long retired we have an offensive lineman yell that their guy stepped out of bounds he turns to the our athlete and said stick your nose back in your book shut up that's what he told the kid a linesman so said that a linesman said that to him the, the, the player was mike mcdonald an offensive lineman from back when watson brown played and I knew then, I said, oh, are you kidding me? So that's the first thing. The second thing, and you'll remember this one. This is a lot of pressure on your mind. You may remember when Woody Woodenoffer was here and we lost to Florida at Gainesville, like 13-7, to 7, something like that. When we would have gone to a bowl at you, it would have been 6-5 team. It was when we played 11 games. Eddie Powers, who was an official, and I think he may have gone on to go to the NFL. I think he's, again, retired. But Eddie was on the sideline. He was a friend of mine. And we were talking during a dead ball. And it was a close game. I said, now, come on. I was joking with him. I said, now, Eddie, come on now. We we can't have a, can't have a blown collar or something like that to that effect. And he said, you know what, Luke? He said, you know, he goes, I have to tell you, I know how much you love Vanderbilt. He said, you know how much money it costs this league if Florida loses tonight and Vanderbilt wins? That's all I had to hear. 
I remember watching one of the Georgia games here under Franklin where I thought that Vanderbilt actually got a couple of bad calls that went their way and just thinking, boy, things have really changed with replay and with them finally winning a few games. Right. Think about the Tennessee game where uh, I guess I think it was Austin Carter Samuels got the first down and the lineman comes running in like he's drunk to try to spot, make the spot. Spots it a full yard back. Remember when we had to challenge it? Challenge right, the yeah, I remember that we one lo- very clearly, yeah. We lose yeah. – without without replay, that game's over. We lose 10-7. to 7. Yeah. That was the game that Pat and Robinette scored the touchdown. Yeah, so, yeah, it's happened. And, again, like I said, it happened 11 times during that 22-year span. That, that's just the Tennessee game. I'm not even – I remember a game at Alabama when we score a touchdown. Greg Zolman's in the end zone. He's across the end zone. His knees are perpendicular. He's not on the ground. Nothing's touching. And they fought the ball at the one. And we lose the game. We wound up losing by 11. But that would have changed everything. At that time, we would have taken the lead in the fourth quarter. Yeah, I've heard that one talked about over there at Vanderbilt in recent oh. years from people other than you. <laughs> the, the claim was, and I don't – Honest to God, I don't remember the game, but the claim was that I think that he scored three times on the same drive and none of them counted. I, I don't. Oh, oh. <laughs> that's not an endorsement of that view. I don't remember the game, but it's just it is pretty funny to hear some of the stories at times. Well, there, there's a well one other quick one. There's there's also against Alabama. There's a there's a picture in the Tennessee, and I think of uh, you remember David Palmer played at Alabama. Yes, he fumbled. He fumbles a punt. I think. It's a punt or kickoff or something. And you can see it in the paper. The ball's out. He's standing up. He's not even close to being on the ground. Tyler Unzicker recovers it for Vanderbilt. And they give the ball back to Alabama. I mean, just absolute. If you had replay, it's obviously Vanderbilt's ball. So, that, that and again, that would have been different than, you know, a 10-point game being a three-point game or whatever it may be. But it's not just Vanderbilt. Let me just say that for sure. It's the teams that are at that time, for instance, last year's team, would probably not gotten any calls at a Tennessee last year because they were sitting on three and eight. It's a Kentucky team that may have been on three and eight one year. It's all. It's not just Vanderbilt. It's always the lower couple of teams. And I think it happens in basketball. I think you may have saw a couple of calls the other night that were a little strange. Okay, this also from Raiders. Give us a sense of reaction by coaches and players in the locker room when unfair officiating has cost Vanderbilt wins. I, I know you were part of many of those locker rooms afterwards. What's that oh, like yeah. when the perception is that things didn't go your way? Well, it, it, it's it's the anger. It's everything you can imagine. It's the banging of the lockers, the throwing of the helmets. The and and you you know, and there's nothing you can do to console the kids because. Coaches don't want you to go over and say, yeah, we know the officials stole it from you. They don't want to say it. They don't want to hear that. They're going to go to the next play or the next game. I get that as a coach, but it's it's heart-wrenching because I've seen it so many times where our kids have left it out there, done enough to win a game, and it not happened, and it is sickening. It is. It's, yeah, it's, it's sickening. You know, Let me say, I've been a part of some great locker rooms, some wins, huge wins, but the ones that you remember the most – still stick out are those type of games. They're absolutely gut-wrenching. I remember a great comment by George McIntyre. This was after we had lost to Tennessee in Knoxville, and we played our rear ends off, got beat, I think, 38 to 34. There was a pass interference that wasn't called in the end zone on Alamo Matthews, I think. And he comes into the locker room, and when the kids are stone silent, tears running down your face, and he makes a comment to the kids. He says, guys, and because you can – you can hear the fans celebrating whatever. He goes, you hear all that? He goes, 10 out of 10 times I'd rather be in this locker room than that one down at the other end of the seal. And that was – that. you know, the kids got their chins up after that. I thought that was one of the best things you could say in that instance. Yeah, and that team won eight games and went to a bowl next year. So, Yeah, you got it. That's right. Let's see. Vandy 96 says, what are the current players most want in terms of facility upgrades, uh, football, men's basketball, any others that you might know about? I would think in football, it would be the lounge that I mentioned before. Uh, you know, the kids, the camaraderie, and I think it's big on camaraderie. You know, the kids, you can sit around in your locker room, but your locker rooms after a practice or whatever get kind of funky. So you don't want to be in there all the time laying around. But that's basically the only option our kids have because – we don't have a large area for them to shoot pool or whatever it may be. So I think football, that one for sure, 
and of course the stadium itself. They would love to have Vanderbilt fans in their own stadium instead of 75% of the other team most of the time. I, that's obvious. I remember Clay Condry one time. We're playing Tennessee in 98. They're undefeated. And we go out for the coin flip, and Clay comes to the sideline, and he's laughing. And I said, what is it? He goes, I asked the referee. He said, don't I get to call the toss since we're the visitors? <laughs> so that's sad. That's <laughs> that a sad, sad comment. But anyway, uh, but for that's for football. Otherwise, I have no idea with baseball. That Tim does such a great job with them. I, it's hard to question anything they do or don't do. Um, basketball, just some of the inner workings. I don't know if you've been. I know you have inside Memorial Gym where the players is and the locker rooms are. I think they could use some more work, but they're still adequate I and mean, above adequate in some in some uh, areas. So I think basketball's not, not in too bad of a shape. Maybe their meeting room areas need to be improved and stuff like that, but it's not it's not critical. I think we've been over this, but I will ask it if there are any loose ends that need to be tied up. Do you believe that Malcolm Turner was promised resources throughout the interview process that Vanderbilt had no intentions of giving him? If so, then do you think the neb- ne- excuse me, negative public perception of Malcolm Turner is warranted? I think that he was promised everything that he spent except for some things costing double what they shouldn't cost. In other words, spinning the high end on something is the best way I could say it. Doing the silly stuff like flying back from Memphis, some stuff like that. Now that wasn't promised. And I do think this, I think that with coach Stackhouse, there's some things that he allowed coach Stackhouse to do that maybe got him in a little hot water because Jerry's calling North Carolina and saying, how do you do things? Well, obviously North Carolina has the resources to do things a little bit different than we do at this point in time. For instance, like parties after the game where they drink and have a big time up in the, uh, I don't know what they call that, uh, the room upstairs in, in Memorial Gym. And then, of course, they do a huge spread for the players after the game. It costs a lot more money than they used to. So I think there's some things that could have been changed. But did Nicholas Zeppos tell him? Absolutely. I, I believe that to my dying that he was told, have at it. Okay, that is the question that I have. I meant to ask this earlier. How did this thing go from Nick Zeppos just really not, whether he didn't allow it, but he at least presided over a situation where for about five years, athletics got nothing to just giving him the keys to the vault almost at that interview. What in the world happened, if you know, between that time. I mean, because it just seemed to be uh, the, one of the weirdest things I have ever said. And, and I feel like I'm probably killing my credibility writing it or saying it, but I believe it. But I feel like Nick Zeppos leaving in hindsight was the worst thing that could have happened to Vanderbilt athletics, but I can't explain. I mean, I guess it was the public embarrassment has always been my theory, but it just is crazy how it changed from the faucet is off to the, you know, the fire hydrant now is on. I think I can answer this with a uh, example of what happened at Vanderbilt before with the athletic director. Do you remember when Paul Houlihan left Vanderbilt and we hired Rod Dauhauer? Yes. That was, that was Paul. Paul knew he was leaving and that was his last hire. He basically did a favor for Bill Walsh. So we got Rod Dauhauer now not saying it's exactly the same situation, but Nick knew he was leaving. He hires someone and gives them carte blanche, but he knows he's not going to be here to see it. So that's easy. That's the way you do that. You know, it's not going to be on my watch anyway. I'm gone. I'm just doing you one big favor athletics on the way out the door. So Nick Zippos knew he was leaving in December of 2018. I do believe that. Yes. Because that was not announced to what, the next May? Right, but I do believe he knew he was leaving. I'll okay. believe that again. Okay, so why why did he feel like he owed athletics a favor at that point? Why was it's, where it's was his heart before like, then? Well, I, I think it's this. I think it's one of those things where you have that guilt when you're walking out the door of, hey, you know what? I've kind of crapped on athletics sometimes over the years. Let me give some final gifts here. It's kind of like the dorms. You know, I, I don't know if, if you know this, but I have 
been told that the money wasn't raised for those to be real built. And if you look, all you got to do is look, they're being built. So, you know, where Carmichael is what I'm referring to. Let, let me say this, Chris. I don't know everything, but what I'm telling you is either coming from a source that's either there, was there during this past year, or I have firsthand knowledge of by being there. That's the three sources, no other source. If there was anything else that I said that was conjecture, I would probably have said that's my guess during that time. So if anyone wants to challenge me or ask me any questions or anything, that's fine. I'm I'm ready to field them. Okay. If if Nick Sepos knows he is leaving. What does he then do to put Malcolm in a better place? Does he know that that's all going to come unraveled? That because I think with you know there was a seventeen million dollar approximately money that was already there at Vanderbilt, and I think he I think he thought well Malcolm can run through that and make some good decisions with that seventeen million. Now I do think I was told again that. Part of that seventeen million went to buy out of Bryce Drew. Yes, uh, that's okay. That's what I was told. The, uh, then there were some other things that he may have overdone by his office, but I think he wanted his office to be really, really nice because he was going to bring people in there and ask them for money. And if you're asking people for money, you want your office to look great, obviously, where you're sitting down talking to them. Um, I think that was where some excess was. Um, so. You know, I just think that that's how it went down. Luke, that was a fantastic interview. Uh, and actually, before we leave it, one more question from Ann Arbor. Any favorite and hopefully funny stories that you have? He says maybe something from Coach Woody Woodenhofer. <laughs> I got, well, there's, there, there's some, but I don't know. Unless you're on satellite radio, I probably can't say them. So uh, <laughs> there were some there were some great ones from Woody Woodenhofer. I'll be honest with you, though, some of the funniest stories were Rod Dauhauer. Um, I'll, I'll give you one good uh, one good Woody one that's uh, PG rated. How about that? And if you can't use it, you can always go back and erase this. Um, we had lost a tough game to Alabama. I think it was nine to six or so. I can't remember the score, but. I think we missed a field goal. Chuck Foligno was the kicker. Do you remember that? Vaguely. And at home. Anyway, so we lose that game. And Woody's pissed when he gets in the locker room. And he just goes through this incredible tirade of cussing. Not that the, He's not mad at the kids. He's just cussing the situation. So as soon as he finally gets through, <laughs> he turns to uh, our chaplain and goes, can we have an F in prayer? Oh, my. <laughs> And I'm like, wow. <laughs> so anyway, that was one of these, but one of the greatest stories, and I've told this to a ton of people on Rod Dowhower. This was now Woody was on the staff, but Rod was the head coach. It was '95, I believe. We're playing at North Texas, and uh, it, and the wind had changed from when we went out to kickoff. There, there was discussion. I think Kirk Williams was our captain at the time, and Rod had told him, "Look, we want the wind." And so we want to go, you know, if we lose the toss, we want the win. So anyway, the wind had changed. So we come back out of the locker room, and Rod realizes that we've pointed the wrong way, so we're not getting the wind or the ball. So Rod goes to the official, hey, no, we can't do this. What are you doing? We haven't kicked off yet now, mind you. And all of a sudden, the referee goes, if you want to talk to me, you got to call a timeout. Well, the clock hadn't started, game hadn't started, timeout. I had the official come over to me. I knew. He said, Luke, you've just witnessed history. First time at ever that a coach has called a timeout that I know of in college football history before the game started. Which that was hilarious. <laughs> which begs a question about a certain uniform situation in 2014. Oh, the LSU. No, the Mason debut against Temple with the penalty. Oh, oh you want to know that answer? Yes. I, I can give you the 100% answer to that. In fact, I could probably find the email that we got from Steve Shaw. Chris Singleton at the time was our head football equipment manager. I was over everything at that time, but Chris was the one that did all the legwork. He did all the tough stuff. 
So when we got those uniforms, they were supposed to, like the academies could put something like that on the back, but they were the only people, the only teams, excuse me, that could have something like that on the back of the uniform. No one else could have that. So we had, of course, anchor down. Well, Chris had dotted all of his I's, crossed all of his T's. He, and I, I can show you, again, I, I think I still have a copy of that email where he said, no, those will be fine. Don't worry about it. So he had okayed the well, evidently, he didn't tell his So during the game, the officials say, these uniforms are illegal. Chris like, no. So Chris runs across the street, pulls the email, prints it, brings it to the official, and shows them. Oh, my. You're kidding. In the middle of the game. Yeah. No. During the game. Absolutely. And I never quite owned up to it. I mean, I think Steve's a great man, and he did a great job with the officials, but Steve said, oh, I don't know that I told you that. And he goes, well, I've got the email. Well, don't worry about showing me the email. It's okay. <laughs> but then they wouldn't let us do it after that. But, yeah, it, we were not in the wrong on that. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, that was a whoops. That was just a whoops. Wow. Well, you know, people make mistakes. And there's, yeah. There's yeah, one. Absolutely. Didn't matter yeah, that evening, but it's – it's uh, that's sort of become intw- intertwined with the fabric of Vanderbilt football. And that was one right. I didn't know. I'm glad I asked. That's the lowdown and the truth about it. Okay. Well, Luke, there's been a lot of truth today. Thank you for <laughs> joining us. I know you wanted to give out your contact info at the end of this so people could get in touch with you, and so I'll give you the floor to do that. Yes, and, I, and there's two things I want to let everybody know, because I'm not hiding from anybody. I know this will probably give me some enemies, and, that, again, I don't care about that, because what I'm trying to do is do what's best for the kids and for our fan base, because I love Vanderbilt University and love Vanderbilt Athletics. My seats at the baseball game, I'll be there today, or in Section I. I'm on Row 9 in Seat 16. If you want to come say hello to me or come tell me your opinion about something, I'll be glad to talk to you. I'm at luke.ben.wyatt at gmail.com. And thank you all so much. And, uh, again, let's just let's do everything we can as a group because it takes, in my opinion, it's not just me. It's going to take a lot of people that know the same things I know that need to get out and make sure our new chancellor, when he comes in, understands things need to change. Luke, you've been a terrific guest. We are doing this recording on a Tuesday. This will probably be aired Wednesday. So there's also Wednesday baseball game. I presume you will be at that one as well. Uh, actually, I won't be Wednesday, okay. but I, I've got to go out of town. But I will be there today. But they know where your seats are. They know where my seats are from now on, and uh, I'm going out of town. And they'll, they'll know, you know anytime they want to come by. I'll be at all the SEC games for sure. He is Luke White, the former equipment manager at Vanderbilt. Uh, that was your title, correct? I was well. I had two titles, uh, uh, three titles: assistant equipment manager, equipment manager, and supervisor of athletic equipment. Okay, those are the three. It's, yeah. Whatever his title, his name is Luke Wyatt. He has been a great guest on this show. I'm Chris Lee, the host of the Vandy Sports Podcast. We appreciate you listening and should have at least one more episode of the podcast coming your way later this week.